to the Touch MBA Admissions Podcast, where we discuss all things related to MBA admissions and how to get into your number one school. If you want to know more about this program, check out our website at touchmba.com. Okay, hey everyone, this is Darren from Singapore MBA Consulting, and I'm here with Dr. Philip Zarillo who's the Executive Director of Postgraduate Coursework Programs at Singapore Management University. And Dr. Z, as he is known among students, um, got his PhD in marketing from Northwestern, and he's taught at top MBA programs around the world, such as Kellogg, uh, University of Texas, Austin, and the Helsinki School of Economics. Um, When I was at SMU, I actually worked very closely with Dr. Z, Uh, And I know he's played a pivotal role in developing the MBA program. He also teaches the core marketing class at SMU, and the students always used to rave to me um, about his classes. So welcome to the show, Dr. Z. Darren, thanks so much. It's good to hear from you again. Could you talk to us about the single, you know, what's the the single most exciting development um, at SMU uh, this year? Well, you know, I, I would say, uh, you know, I, I don't know if I would confine it to one single thing, but it, but several things that I really think are exciting and, and happening here at uh, Singapore Management University are, first of all, um, if I look at our students, our um, class is really starting to diversify a great deal here. Yeah. Um, if I look at the uh, number of people that we're bringing in and where they're coming from, some areas and some places where we haven't um, had a lot of students from in the past, we're now getting multiple students coming in. Um, So we're starting to get a lot more reach in places like uh, Japan, uh, the Philippines, Korea, Vietnam. Um, So what we're doing is is we're we're seeing many more students coming from a diverse set of countries uh, around Southeast Asia. Also, we're starting to attract uh, students from North America and uh, Europe as well. Um, And we're starting to see uh, students... uh, uh, enter the program. Um, I know that you know a couple of years ago you had recruited a gentleman by the name of Sander Bogdan. Yes. And Sander yes. Uh, eventually became our uh, valedictorian in the MBA class. Um, we posted his um, interview when he was exiting the university, and you know just his discussion about what a nice place it was to go to school and and uh, how as an American he felt very comfortable uh, going to school over here. And what we're doing is we're finding a lot more applications uh, coming into Singapore Management University from some of these other uh, English-speaking or primarily English-speaking uh, places around the world. So I, I think the first thing that's exciting is just the, uh, the change in our application pool that we have here at the university. Um, you know, we're kind of new to graduate education here at Singapore Management University. Hence, one of the reasons why you don't see us in a lot of the rankings. Um, we actually have to wait until we've had at least four graduating classes from the MBA program before we're eligible to be ranked and things like this. So yeah. some of these things, you know, will take care of themselves here very, very soon as, as we move along. But, um, you know, these are just parts of being a new program. So if I look at and I, and I look at this university, what's exciting right now is how healthy the intake looks uh, in terms of new students coming into the uh, program. You know, the first couple of years are very difficult to get the word out and get people interested. Mm-hmm. Now what you're seeing is you're really starting to see uh, – you know, a, a really increasing wave of demand um, for for this program. Um, second thing is, is we've uh, revamped the curriculum a bit here at the university. You know, we've always been uh, very, very internationally focused in terms of the pedagogy and what have you. Yes. And um, what we've done is, is um, as you know, I started a case writing initiative uh, several years ago, and it's now turned into an actual center on case writing. And What's happened is we've written a great number of cases about the businesses in this region. And the number of cases that we have downloaded by sister universities and what have you has been increasing by four to six hundred percent a quarter for the past wow. year. So what's happening is, is there's a lot of interest in the pedagogy that we're developing here at the university because we have a lot of people going out writing cases about um, businesses in Vietnam, businesses over in Thailand, businesses out in Indonesia. And these cases are becoming very, very um, um, interesting to students who want to really come out here and learn about this region. So I think from a, from a pedagogical standpoint, one of the real um, changes to this program has just been our commitment as a university to develop the stories of Asia. So 
people yeah. coming here and people going to school here are not just going to get Western business um, models, but they're also going to get some of the local models as well. And our faculty, you know, 60% of our faculty have got their PhDs from the West, mm. but writing these stories about the East, if you will. And then the other thing that's happened curriculum wise is what we've done is, is we've developed a uh, special projects uh, class for all of the MBA students. So as they go through their entire time here, they have a project which um, gives them a real, um, if you will, application base to their education. So, you know, one of the things that uh, sometimes universities are accused of is being a little bit theoretical and not as applied or, or application based. Well, this is a project that gets overseen from the moment that they walk in the door until they leave, but it's an application based uh, um, uh, opportunity for the students. And then I think, uh, you know, the last thing is, is we really uh, tried to ramp up our um, connection with industry through this case writing as well as through our executive ed education outreach. And what this has done is it's really led to a much more vibrant placement market for our students around the region. <clears throat> so we're getting offers from n a number of these case writing centers to employ our graduates when they wow. uh, graduate in these um, more distant markets and what have you, as well as they're offering uh, internships and things like that to our students. So. You know, Darren, if I, if I had to say what's, what's uh, exciting, I think what's exciting is, is some of the health, right? Um, you know, I've been uh, an administrator in a number of universities, including my time as the dean at Texas, and it, it's really uh, quite um, reaffirming that uh, these things are all starting to come together. So there's a confluence of things that are really healthy uh, indicators of the vital signs of the program. Wow, that is fantastic. Um I, for those of you um, listening, I will post a link to uh, the interview with Sander, uh, which is on YouTube. So we'll be sure to link to that um, in the show notes. Um, yeah, and that very thin guy sitting next to Sander. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, in terms of the special pedagogy um, of, of SMU, can you talk a little bit more, uh, more about that? Yeah, you know, I mean... Uh, uh, SMU was set up initially when the um, when the, the current president of uh, Singapore, Tony Tan, um, mm -hmm. envisioned this university when he was uh, minister of education. It was really a uh, the idea was that this was supposed to be a different university, and it was set up with a very Western style of, of teaching. So it's yeah. very interactive. It was meant to be interactive right from the beginning. The other thing is. Um, we went to small lecture um, classrooms. So we have no classrooms on the campus with over 65 seats in them. So the idea here is, is let's move people into um, smaller classroom sizes where they can have interactive lectures. All of the classrooms are horseshoe shaped or theater style so that students are um, able to see each other, engage with each other, and conversations are started. Um, so if I, if I look at the pedagogy itself and the way things are delivered, this has been a very um, interactive, um, Western style um, teaching environment here. Um, what that has done is it's created very different students. Our students are very comfortable speaking, speaking up, uh, very comfortable discussing things and, and being what I would call intellectually curious. Um, this is really translated in large part to some of the higher um, uh, compensation that our graduates get upon exit from the university. As you know, our undergraduate program here has the uh, yeah. highest uh, salaries upon exit um, in the Singapore market. Um, though we're a new school, um, you know, part of that is due to the teaching style. Also, part of it is due to you know the people that we select and, and uh, what have you. Um, so, pedagogically, I think you know this is a different university. I, I always say that this was a undergraduate institution. It was a graduate institution parading as an undergraduate hmm. institution. I mean, it was really set up like a graduate school. We, we had uh, worked with Wharton during the initial um, design development and uh, early stages of the uh, university's uh, creation. And we've maintained that partnership with Wharton through the years. Um, it's been the sort of thing that uh, has really led to a different teaching environment and a different uh, uh, teaching style. But the other thing that's happening is, is um, the leadership of this university has really made a commitment to 
bring the faculty closer to the industry itself. Mm -hmm. So you know, business is still one of our um, you know business is still our primary um, uh, school here at the university. We're still a Singapore management university, even though we have a law school, a school of accounting, and a, a school of information sciences and social sciences and economics. The you know uh, business school is still a large part of the uh, portfolio, and what we've done is we've opened up a center for management practice. Now there is. To my knowledge, no other university that's hmm. set up a center such as this. In the center of management practice, the idea is to bring the faculty closer to the problems of business. So it's a place where faculty can do immersions in, in uh, corporations. Corporations can also bring their executives into the university. Um, this is uh, the place where we do a lot of the case writing and things like this. So it's the sort of thing where we're putting our people in contact with the problems that businesses face which makes our students when they come out the door uh, a great deal more um, worldly and uh, they're able to begin their careers and has a, have a very, very easy ramp up into the work, their work life. Yes, I mean, and, and I, I saw, um, you know, on, on the site that class participation counts for 20 to 50 percent yeah. <laughs> of the grade. Often, and I, I remember when when I was working at SMU um, that you know the students really, really loved having this um, intimate connection with their professors. You know, who many of whom ha who uh, had experience working in industry, um, as well. Um, but uh, you mentioned that the class size there's no class that is uh, larger than that seats more than 65 students, and and I know that the class size in this past year of the MBA program was 60. Um, so, do you plan to keep the program this size, this small, intimate size, or are you planning to expand it? Um, and I, I think I'm sure some students might think, "Oh, you're only taking in 60 students. Um, do I even have a chance, you know, of, of getting into a program like this?" So, could you talk a little bit more about uh, the class size? Uh, yeah, of the program? yeah. You know, uh, when we started out, we were running about 15 or 20 students in. Uh, our part-time uh, MBA program and also about 15 to 20 students in the uh, full-time program. Um, now what's happened is is we've gotten to where um, we're running 50 to 60 students in each one of those uh, each one of those uh, programs. Now that's pretty much a full class, right? If you yeah. think about the size of a classroom physically, we have about 60 seats in a classroom. So those are really full classes. Um, we've kind of capped it this year as, as we're going to run one full cohort of each one of these. But I think next year what we'll be doing is we'll be moving to multiple cohorts. Mm. Now there's some advantages to having multiple cohorts because when it comes time for electives, you have a you know, have a critical mass of students which allows you to offer uh, more electives in the future. So again, this is one of those health things that uh, as we get more applications and we move to multiple intakes of students, we have the opportunity to offer more electives and, and uh, things like this because uh, you know, we have just a volume of students that will be going through the, through the uh, programs. Um, in terms of do I have an ability to get into this program, you know, we always have room for talented students. So, uh, you know, I think that one thing that we're going to um, continue on is that I don't think our admissions criteria is going to go up particularly, mm -hmm. but I also don't expect it to go down at all. Right. So it's it's going to uh, I think we're just going to continue to recruit the same types of candidates. The only thing is we're going to be recruiting more of them and from more diverse regions. So I expect the program to grow. I would suggest that next year we will have two and possibly even three cohorts um, coming in next year, um, which is, is very, very good from the standpoint of uh, you know competitions and um, the opportunity for students to meet a diverse group of people and yeah. um, things like that. So the, again, these are all very, very healthy things and having taught at very large um, MBA programs like the University of Texas or Northwestern University or uh, Vanderbilt University. I would just say that these are, are the uh, sort of things that are very, very good just in terms of your overall experience. Great. Yeah. And, and we'll later later in the show, we'll definitely get to admissions and what that means and what you guys are looking for. Okay. Um, but in, in terms of the class size as well, um, I know SMU um, is, is, like you said, it's a young program. It's got this unique pedagog pedagogy. You know, you're ramping up the corporate connections. Um, but 
and, and, and I know that um, you've recently been awarded the Equus accreditation as well, um, along yes. with AACSB, which is amazing for a program that's you know only been running for, for, for less than five years. But what would you have to say to, uh, to prospective candidates to SMU about um, career, career placement? You know, given that the school is, is still unranked, it's still a young program, um, and yeah, like, could you talk a little bit more about um, what students can expect from the career services and, and how successful you guys have been in, in terms of placing uh, graduates from the program? Yeah, you know, I mean, look, last year we had, uh, you know, you, you have to report your graduates um, six, six months out from graduation day what the percentage of your people are that are uh, fully employed. And last year, 96% of our, our students were fully employed um, six mm -hmm. months out. That would compare more than favorably with any institutions in the West. Um, so any of the uh, Western, um, you know, top 25 MBA programs in the world are, are not going to see better numbers than that. Um, as a matter of fact, these would be very much on the high side of, of any uh, employment numbers that we see uh, for those universities. So I think one of the things that, that first I want to say is, is that our placement numbers have been very uh, good. Um, and this has really been something that has been a little bit of a struggle for us as a university because it's a new program and, and we have to get the word out. And as a new program, you're not ranked right away, right? As I said, you have to wait four years until we're um, until the institution um, can go up for ratings and go up for rankings. Um, so it's the sort of thing that, uh, you know, we're probably not going to be ranked for another year and a half or, or thereabouts. Yep. Now, Having said that, um, you know you have to start calling your employers and connecting with your employers and asking them to you know take a look at your students and and interview your students and, and give them the time. Now in the early days, that's a little bit harder sell, and, and the university is only twelve years old to begin with. Um, but one thing that we found is, is if I look at our undergraduate programs, um, one hundred percent of our undergraduates were. Um, placed at graduation day uh, last year. So yeah. it's the sort of thing where um, we've had remarkable relationships with the um, corporate recruiters throughout the region with the undergraduate program and it's transferred very nicely to our uh, graduate programs now. Um, as I say, in the early days we kind of struggled with this a bit, um, but you know, last year's class, I mean, it wasn't the best job market this last year. Yeah. Um, as a lot of people have been uh, stalling their, their hires, but 96% of our people were placed at graduation, or I mean within six months of graduation. And uh, you know, quite frankly, the ones that weren't um, had really been from family businesses and they yeah, are. <laughs> yeah. And I, I mean, did most of the students um, from the full-time program, did they end up working in Singapore or uh, did they go back to their home countries? Well, the, uh, the overwhelming majority stayed in Singapore. Yeah, um, yeah. There were a number of people, though, that, that did go back um, to their home countries. Um, you know, we had uh, some uh, folks from Thai, you know, we had some Thai students. Uh, we had some students like Xander who went back to the United States after he was done with his degree. Um, a, a couple of students went back to India. So they, they, some of them did go back, but I would say even of the students, who um, went back to their home countries, they probably only represented 50% of the people from their country that, that came over here. So right. probably half of the international students wound up staying over here in Singapore. Yeah, and, and you know, with a sort of accelerated one-year program that SMU has, could you talk a little bit more about um, internship placements for, for, for yeah. students? Yeah, you know we've we've had an intern we've had a series of internship programs here, and uh, students are are able to do a twelve week internship um, as they go through the program. So what we do is we begin having their classes in the late summer. Those classes will be in the evenings, and that opens up time for them to work a uh, summer job during or work a uh, internship uh, during the day. Um, it's become mandatory for international students or from uh, for these students to to uh, take an internship. Um, huh. Roughly ninety plus percent of them engage in internships. You you mentioned this new special projects class, mm -hmm. um, and I just wanted to get back to that really quickly. Um, do the students have a choice in in deciding what they study, or are, are there certain um, classes that are already 
sort of made up that they can enroll in, or how, how does that work? Well, it's a little bit of both, Darren. I mean, if people come in and they've got a uh, particular um, issue that they want to study and they know it coming in the door, we certainly welcome that and we try to pair them up with faculty members that can oversee that project. On the other hand, if um, the students don't have an idea, then what we do is we try to generate some projects for them to work on as well. Right? And we always have you know, businesses looking, uh, you know, businesses interacting with us that have you know, specific um, problems or issues that they'd like to have studied. Okay. So a little bit of both. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's a great, great new uh, addition to the program. Yeah, it's a, it's a wrinkle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, before we get into admissions uh, talk, is is there one area of the program that you wish more international students? Because within Singapore, you know, um, everyone knows that SMU is you know one of the top universities in Singapore. Um, yeah. But in terms of outside of Singapore, you know. Uh, is there one area of the program that you wish applicants knew more about? Yeah, you know, Darren, I'll, I'll tell you what. I, I mean, if, if I look at this program, you know, now I've, you know, I've taught at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. I've taught at uh, Thomasite University in Thailand. I've taught up at, uh, you know, I've taught with the University of Maryland. Wow. I've taught um, Emory University. I've taught with uh, the University of Texas, Northwestern. <laughs> I've taught a lot of different schools, and you know, one of the things that I see here is I see one is that we have tremendous students. Right, I go in the classroom; the students are are ready, they're prepared, and the level of conversation is is quite high um, in the classrooms here. So, I think from the standpoint of who it is you go to school with, I don't think that you're going to find better students anywhere in the world. Right, this is a very very solid group of students and you know both technically as well as um, strategically these people are, are very very uh, advanced so that would be the first thing the second thing is is that the level of English fluid fluency and English competency in this program is very high hmm. I think um, you know if I look at Western students and you know yourself having grown up in the United States maybe not all of the students really understand some of the nuances and differences between different countries out here in Asia mm. and if we talk to the average uh, American Canadian or Mexican student let's say they might not understand you know just what the level of uh, facility with the English is in a place like uh, Singapore yeah. so this place where you know the instructors there's no communication problems here in terms of the instructors abilities to be able to speak English in the classroom and I think that's always one of the things for an international student looking at potentially coming to a far and distant land yep. um, one of the things that scares them right um, so I think that's one of the first things is is that I'd like to you know put people's concerns or their fears uh, I'd like to ease them and let them know that, you know, the classmates that you're going to go to school with are very, very, first of all, they're very kind people out here. And, and uh, secondly, they're very intelligent, very uh, hardworking people and the level of commitment and professionalism in the classroom is very high. And the teachers are also very, very competent, very, very fluent in English. And there really is no, um, you know, there's no slip on um, things such as that. So, I mean, if you talk to, if you watch that interview with Sander, you know, this is one of the first things that Sander, um, you know, explains to people is, you know, as an American, I found this to be a very, very soft landing. That's great. Yeah. And again, we'll, we'll link to that, that interview. If we could sort of switch our focus to admissions, what everyone wants to know. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So I know before when I used to work um, at SMU, we used to have three, three deadlines for the full-time program. And um, but I I know that uh, it's changed a bit um, in terms of how quickly you get back to applicants once they apply. Um, yeah. So I, I see three deadlines on the site, you know, for the full time program starting in January. So could you sort of walk us through the life of an application in your office? Um, what happens from when you know someone submits an application? When do they hear back from you in terms of for an interview or? A so let me let me just start out by saying that uh, you know when it comes to applications, the first thing is is the earlier you apply, um, the better, and that's for a couple of different reasons. Is one. Um, 
just in terms of, of the places are still available in the program, and we're going to cap it at some level, whether it's 60, 120, 180, whatever that is. So there's, there's uh, certainly the earlier the better um, in, t in terms of applications, but it shouldn't dissuade you if, if your timing is not uh, on the early side. Also, you know, uh, we have a pile of, we have piles of money for um, scholarships and, and things like this, and, and certainly all of them are still open and available on the first day. By the time we get later in the cycle, some of those are not as available as, mm -hmm. they, as they might have been. So while I wouldn't discourage anybody later in the cycle, I would certainly say that the earlier you can get in, always the better. Um, the second thing is, is what happens in the application cycle. Now, it used to be that what we would do is we would take applications in and then we would wait until the end of the cycle. And then at the end of the cycle or the uh, application period, we would begin um, calling people for interviews. And, and it might be 30, 45, 60 days from when you submit it until you got an interview here at the university. Well, one of the things that we did um, is we just have made this process much faster because we realize that people who are applying have lots of schools that they want to consider or what have you. So we try to get back to people in a very timely fashion. So now what happens here at the university is when you apply, as soon as you complete your application, okay, within seven days we have you scheduled for an interview. When you have your interview, within seven days we get back to you with a decision. And you're either in the pro, you either get an offer from the program, you get a decline from the program, or if you are going to be on a wait list, which, which uh, we try to keep the wait list to a minimum, mm. we let you know that you're on the wait list during that, that time period. So um, what we tried to do is speed up the process a great deal for people. Um, what we were finding was uh, we lost a lot of very qualified candidates because what happened was they just didn't um, know if they were getting in the program or not. And they, they made alternate plans and, and uh, it was the sort of thing that uh, we, we probably missed out on some very, very solid candidates in the past. The second thing that we've done is we've tried to make the process a great deal more streamlined. Um, initially, the, the program had had five um, essays um, that we wanted people to write. Now what we've done is we've said, look, the, pro the, the need for an essay is to give people an opportunity to tell us something unique and different about themselves mm -hmm. and also to look at their writing and their ability to communicate with a written word and things like that. Um, really, two essays is probably enough. And so what we've done is we reduced the number of um, essays needed for an application from five to two. So it's, it's streamlined the process. It's made it a little bit easier for people to get their applications in in a timely manner. Um, and um, it's, it's uh, speeded up the entire process. Yeah, uh, so I think I'm sure many ears perked up when you said a few things. So the first is that you will return, SMU will return a decision basically within 14 days. Is, is that correct? Uh, seven days to it's four to days. What we'll do is within seven days we'll schedule an interview. Now it may be three days till you can get your interview, or right. your schedule might be such that it takes you ten days or whatever right. to get your interview. But from the day that you get your interview, then it's seven days until we return a decision again. Wow, that that is fantastic. Um, yeah, and, you know, and, and this is the sort of thing that uh, you know look. We just want to maintain contact. If this is something that you've gone through the steps of the process, we're not going to let let down on our side to where uh, you know we don't uh, give you the attention that your application deserves. So yeah. that's what we really tried to uh, ramp up here. And you know, quite frankly, I'll, I'll tell you, Darren, this has been really why I think a lot of the numbers have started to grow in terms of our number of students matriculating is simply because um, it's a continued interest and. I think people began to look for other options when um, the process lags on a little too long. Yeah, I think um, you know that is just fantastic that someone can apply and get a decision with you know within two, three, four weeks. I think that's fantastic. Um, yeah. And then in terms of the other ear ear perking thing I heard was piles of money for scholarships. So could you talk a little bit more about? You know the scholarships that are available to to candidates, both both international and and Singaporean. Yeah, you know we we have a number of scholarships, and about forty five percent of our students last year were on scholarship of some sort, and uh, or excuse me, sixty percent had a scholarship of some sort, and forty five percent of those students, forty five percent of students had multiple scholarships. So um, there is money available here at the university. 
Um, you know, it, it's you know, it's it's the sort of thing. That's what I spend a lot of my time doing is trying to raise uh, money for scholarships and yeah. things like this for the graduate um, programs here at the university. So we we are out, you know, constantly looking at. Uh, uh, employers and, and people like this to become involved and to help to sponsor some of the students and, and uh, what have you. Um, you know, it's the sort of thing that, you know, we always wish we had more scholarship money available. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we've, we've done a good job of uh, being able to assist students. Now, you know, it's not the sort of thing that uh, we're looking at 100% uh, uh, tuition uh, scholarships, right. but, uh, you know, we've had fairly significant levels of scholarship. Uh, um, participation. Wow, so f all, nearly half the class has been awarded a scholarship. Uh, I mean, are, is the range, could you give us a range in terms of what a typical uh, award would be? Well, you know, most of them tend to be in the in the area of somewhere between um, 15 and um, 15 to 30 percent of the tuition. Oh, wow, that's still, um, yeah. that's great. Yeah, most of them tend to be in that range. Now, you know, we do have some some fully paid uh, um, scholarships, and we have some scholarships that, that work out to about 10% of, of tuition, but, uh, you know, most of the things tend to be in that 15 to 30% range. Okay, fantastic. And and uh, for the... Um, and a lot of students... Yeah. Oh, excuse, I'm sorry. I was going to say, a lot of students have multiple scholarships as well. So it yeah. might be the sort of thing that they have 15% and then another 20% for something else. So um, it's not to say that people don't have more than a 30% scholarship. Great. And, and yeah, I'd encourage um, those of you listening to check out uh, the scholarship page that SMU MBA program has. Uh, they've listed all the different scholarships um, that are available. Um, so definitely check out that resource, which I'll link to in the show notes. And um, I guess the other question is, you know, what, what are you really, what types of candidates are you looking for? You mentioned qualified, right? But can you unpack that? Um, a little bit in terms of what you're looking for. I know SMU um, has a slightly older uh, class than average, um, but could you talk a little bit more uh, about, you know, what types of candidates are you looking to attract to the program? Well, you know, I mean, Darren, I mean, if they can walk on water, that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, yeah. seriously, yeah. <laughs> Darren, you know, what we're looking for is, is one, people who have demonstrated an academic profile that indicates that they're going to be able to do the work here at the university. So, you know, a good academic track record is a very important thing. So, you know, secondly, we'd like to find people who have a good work profile, right, that have shown um, a good, solid uh, career pro progression, that they're starting to manage people or they're managing uh, people and they're responsible for significant decisions within their firm. Um, the reason that you want those type of people is they add a great deal to your discussion. Um, they're people that, you know, once you begin to start managing people, your career is is going to uh, go in a direction in which you're going to have great impact. So we're looking for people that, um, you know, have shown that early ability to be able to manage and to lead and to handle uh, bigger decisions within, within organizations. The third thing we're looking for is we're looking for people that are um, – going to have an impact in society. So not just business, but also will they impact society in a, in a positive and a, in a uh, purposeful way. So people who have had community impact and, and things like this. So if I, if I had to look at, you know, kind of three um, areas of competency that we look for in people, these would be the three areas. Now, if I look for, if I look at candidates and I say, who's the ideal candidate? You know, I want to see people that uh, can come in and put a story together that can actually um, are able to project and to um, uh, put together a, a storyline that allows them to communicate um, very complex problems to the interviewers. So what we're looking for is people that are going to have those solid presentation skills and solid uh, human interaction skills that uh, are going to be in large part what uh, take you great places in your career. Yeah, and, and so speaking of the interview, um, every candidate who is admitted to the program has to be interviewed? That is correct. Okay, and, and um, who conducts the interviews? Uh, is it student alumni or faculty or the MBA admissions office? 
Well, it's it's a combination. There's at least one faculty member, and sometimes there's two, and wow. um, they'll conduct it either. You know, we'll have as many as two faculty members, or we may have uh, two faculty members and a person from the uh, MBA admissions uh, office. Um, but kind of as a maximum, we have three people interviewing you. Um, sometimes it's as few as uh, two people okay. inter interviewing you. But uh, it's some combination of faculty and MBA admissions office. We have not, to this point, used our MBA um, students to go out uh, as alumni, our past students, to do these interviews. This will be something we'll probably move to in the future. But you know, as a young program with only uh, you know fifty or sixty graduates. It would be very taxing for them to uh, handle all of the interviews at this stage. As the program grows and we have a, a more vast alumni, we'll, we'll probably uh, migrate more towards that model. Yeah, and, and I just want to say to to, to uh, candidates out there listening that um, just to have this opportunity to interview with a faculty member of, of the program is really an amazing opportunity because, of course, you're going to have to you know, have great responses and be ready to, to share your story, but you also get to ask the faculty about their teaching experience in the program and, and really hear firsthand what it's all about. So I think that's, that's, that's very special, um, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, that, I, I know that, <laughs> that to have for, you know, that two faculty, I mean, these are, these are world-class faculty, you know, who are, you know, spending the time to interview you. Um, so... You know, I understand when the program gets bigger, it won't be possible to do that. But I, I, I do think uh, that's a very unique part of the application process. Well, you know, I think what will happen, you know, as we grow is is uh, we'll probably still continue to do faculty interviews here at the university. But uh, maybe for some of the more distant applications, um, yeah. we'll get a local uh, a local graduate, which is what we've done at uh, many other universities I've worked with in the past. Yeah. Okay, great. And and you mentioned one of your three criteria was sort of experience leading people and managing people. Um, mm -hmm. What would you say to someone who, you know, whether because of its it's uh, that person's function or their industry, they just haven't had that opportunity yet to 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 manage others. Um, yeah, would, I mean, should they still apply or? Yes, absolutely. And, and, you know, we recognize that is that there's some career paths where you're probably not going to be managing people until a, you get to a certain level. Like take a, you know, a typical scientist, um, you know, if you're a bench scientist in a pharma company, it's, you know, you're probably 15 years at that company until you've really got any significant leadership position, right? You're going to be a scientist uh, creating uh, molecules um, somewhere on a team, right? And so what we would look for is not that you've led, but that you've been a part of a team and that people, when we read through your recommendations and things like this, we're going to look for your collegiality, your ability to influence within the team and things like that. So these are the kind of things that we really begin to hone in on when we look at the um, um, recommendations and things like that on your on your application. Got it. And, and finally, the question that's on a lot of people's minds is uh, GMAT score. So um, I, I saw that the class average is about a 650 or 660, I believe. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, is there a minimum score? I mean, um, that you're looking for? No, we don't have a published minimum score. Um, you know, let me let me be very direct about this, though, Darren. Is right. is that you know I've I've been the dean of these programs these types of programs for a lot of years. And one thing that we do find is is that a solid GMAT score correlates very well with people's academic progression in these programs. Mm. So, you know, a, a good GMAT score is very important. Now, is it the end all and the be all? Absolutely not. And you know what? We wouldn't spend our time interviewing people and we would not um, ask a, an admissions committee to oversee all these applications as all we wanted was a GMAT score. Yeah. If all we wanted was a GMAT score, we would publish what the GMAT score had to be, and then we would let um, people, um, they could register <laughs> online, we would become MBA.com. <laughs> <laughs> I would say is, is that we, we try to look beyond that GMAT, yeah. but you know, it's not to say that you know a solid GMAT is not uh, required. 
right? Now, does everybody have to have a 750 GMAT or a 700 GMAT or something like that? No. And we do pe- accept some people under 600 in our, in our uh, uh, program. Mm. But people have generally, um, they have some other things that are, are uh, very, very solid about their applications, either their past experiences or, you know, their interviews or, or things like that. Yeah. So, and we've turned down some people with excellent GMAT scores. Yeah, I mean, it sounds um, from from what you've told me that you know the communication and pre- presentation skills are very important for us and you. So, Doctor Z, I, I want to thank you so much uh, for your time. Um, I, I know you're a very busy man, so thank you for for spending you know an hour with us and and uh, shedding more light on the program. Um, if candidates are more interested to to, are interested to find out more about SMU or to actually talk to students, you know, where would you recommend they go yeah, to find out so, more information? You know, certainly you're always welcome to contact me in my email. And, uh, you know, unfortunately for the university, my picture is up all over the, uh, <laughs> all over the website. And if that doesn't scare people away, uh, people are certainly welcome to contact me. Um, the That's other great. thing I would suggest is that they go directly to the uh, MBA program and uh, that they contact uh, um, either Gilbert Chua or Edwin Lim Yi Ping, who are the uh, uh, two people working in admissions here at the university. And uh, That's all, they do a Don't great job of interacting with people and, and helping, like to, helping the them show, navigate this process. Let us know at touchmba.com. Okay, so, yeah, we'll see you those emails below. And uh, thank you again, Dr. Z. And uh, we'll, Thanks, hopefully we can do this again next year as well, see what's yep. changed with the program. And hopefully we'll catch up with each other on the road somewhere. Yeah, exactly. All right, right, Dr. Z.